Well, last Wednesday night, if you weren't here, you could go back on the live stream and we'll have that up on the YouTube channel soon. But um, we talked about the power of hope and we talked about Bible hope and the fact that as Christians, we should be people with, full of glistening hope or full of hope, right? What does that mean? Hope from a Bible standpoint doesn't mean, well, I, do you think this is, God's going to do this in your life? Well, I just hope so. <laughs> That's not Bible hope, is it? What is Bible hope? It's confident expectation, isn't it? It's confident expectation. It means you live on the edge of your seat. It's, it's like you're expecting all the time. When you're coming to church, do you expect God to release what you need from heaven? Amen? Amen. So there's an approach, there's a spirit of faith, there's an approach to every part of your life. When you're filled with Bible hope, you're filled with confident expectation, and you're constantly expecting the goodness of God to break into your life all the time. You just live. It's, it's like you live uh, just constantly seeing the goodness of God and expecting the goodness of God. And if it hasn't happened yet, you're expecting it any second. So you live excited. You live, here's a big key, I think, is enthusiasm. You know, the world has hijacked the term enthusiasm and just made it to be kind of a personality trait. But here's what enthusiasm really means. It means to be full of God. If you look up the old historical uh, definitions from Webster's from the 1800s, it means to be in, in, full of, and theo, God, full of God. I may have messed that up a little bit, but somewhere, if you look it up, it means to be full of God. So somebody that's enthusiastic about life or attacks life with a smile, with hope, with faith, that means you're full of God, right? And our enthusiasm should come from the Lord. Our hope should come from the Lord, amen? We talked a lot about hope last week. I wanna talk a little bit about the types of hope and really get into some specifics, but we talked about the power and hope in a testimony. We constantly have testimonies in this church because whenever somebody releases a testimony, we're releasing the spirit of faith for somebody to experience the same miracle again. So that's one type of hope. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 30, the light of the eyes rejoices the heart and a good report makes the, the bones healthy. Don't you love a good testimony, a good report? I mean, I love hearing a testimony from one of you about something great God has done. Last weekend when Felix said uh, the two nights that he ministered, he had 30 people come to Jesus. That gets me excited. That pumps me up. Amen. And then Monday night, the juvenile uh, outreach went awesome. And just good things happening. P you know, breakthroughs on your job. You prayed for somebody and they got healed. You got a financial blessing. Whatever it is, you know, I just love hearing these testimonies. They bless me. And when you hear a testimony, I believe that blesses you. And because you, you know God is no respecter of persons, right? So there's the power and hope in the testimony. There's the hope of glory. The hope of glory. We're the New Testament church. What does that mean? That means Colossians 1.27 says this. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is this mystery, Paul? What are you talking about? What, what's this mystery? He goes on to tell us what the mystery is, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Church, the glory of God is on the inside of you. Amen. Jesus is on the inside of you. Amen? Hallelujah. Not only is he there, we get to enjoy our Lord. We get to enjoy his glory. How do you know? Romans 5, 2 in the Amplified says this. Through him also, we have our access, entrance, introduction, by faith into this grace, the state of God's favor in which we firmly and safely stand. And let us rejoice and exult in our hope of experiencing and enjoying the glory of God. <laughs> Proper biblical New Testament Christianity. You want to know what part of that is, church? It's having a lifestyle of enjoying the glory of God. 
Worship, you know, when you're driving in your car, you put worship music on and you begin to worship him and what happens? The glory of God comes upon you. The glory of God is released out of your heart. His presence is there all the time available to us. As Christians, that is so foreign to the world. When you try and talk to an unsaved person about experiencing God's presence and his glory, it just, it, it's hard for them to comprehend it. But as Christians, this is part of our salvation. Not to just Christ died to redeem us, but he wanted to come and take up residence on the inside and be a real, personal, intimate God. Not that he just wanted to walk beside us, but he literally comes inside of us. And he's inside of us and he lives in us. And in him we live and move and have our being. That is so amazing. We don't have a religion. We have a, a state of uh, being in Christ. It's, it's so different. It's a living reality. We have a living Christ on the inside of us. I'm telling you what, I don't care what your problem is. If you have a living Christ on the inside of you, uh, you don't have any trouble. All you need is faith in God. I'm just going to take that right from R.W. Shambach. Amen. I mean, think about it. You've got a living Christ on the inside of you. <laughs> wow. He's awesome. He's awesome in each one of you. But you know, the enemy will try and take our attention off the fact that God's right here inside us and get us thinking about a million other things that don't have anything to do with our situation. And if we just put our attention on the fact, wait a minute, El Shaddai's inside me. <laughs> El Elyon, the most high God, El Shaddai, the God who is too much, right? Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, my righteousness. And you can start going through the names of God. Jehovah Rapha, my healer. I thank God that we can pray for each other and minister healing. It's awesome. But you know what else is awesome? Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, my healer, is in me. And all the time, his healing virtue is flowing, flowing, flowing in my being. So when I come around someone, they're liable to get healed because I'm there because he's in me and he's in you. And everywhere you go, healing can happen. Amen. Because who's in you? Glory to God. Then there's the hope of righteousness by faith. You might say, what do you mean? Well, do you understand? We, we understand that we're righteous by faith. Even though we've experienced the born again experience, even though we experience the glory of God, um, the final consummation of our salvation, when we're standing in the, in the absolute presence of God after this life ends, then, then think about that. Um, then is the actual reality of that righteousness where we no longer have to exercise any faith in it. Right now, I have to exercise faith that I'm righteous because the word says I'm righteous. Do you know there's days I wake up and I don't feel real righteous? Have you ever woken up and you're like, if I'm saved, I don't know it. Has anybody woke up like that? Oh yeah, if you would be honest, all of you have woken up, maybe even this week you've had a day where you woke up and you're like, am I saved? Because salvation isn't a feeling. We walk by faith and not by sight. It doesn't mean we throw our feelings out either. I, I don't subscribe to that, that our feelings are irrelevant because I believe God has created every part of our being to experience him, Okay. But there's times where you just take the word of God for what it says. The Bible believe, says it, I believe it, that settles it, end of discussion. And that's, that's, I believe, the best way to live, and it's the most peaceful way to live. And then we have eternal hope. What is that eternal hope? We have eternity with God. Amen? That hope that we'll all, uh, one way or another, we're going to experience that eternal hope, aren't we? And be together with God forever. We haven't experienced the fullness of that yet. Amen? The Bible says we have the first fruits of that. I don't have my glorified body yet. Do you? <laughs> I'm looking forward to that glorified body. Every year that goes by, it seems like we're all going to look forward to that glorified body just a little bit more. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. There is the hope of his calling. We scratched this last week but didn't get a chance to talk about it much. But in Ephesians 1.17, it says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. I'm going to stop right there. 
Notice in here, it says, what is the hope of his calling? God has a calling for your life and mine. I, in my life, I want to do the hope of his calling. He's called me to something, right? And we could go all through the Bible and find, especially the New Testament, and find the specific things he's called all of us to, like holiness, like righteousness, like peace, like love, like joy, like supernatural power and miracles, right? You go all through the Bible, those general things, and then there's more, more specific things. But he, God has given each of us a calling in his body. But then it says, his inheritance in the saints. It's his inheritance. So many times we read this and we think it's our inheritance. And yes, we inherit things because Jesus died. Absolutely. He's the only one who's ever died and then came back to life to make sure you got what he paid for you to get. <laughs> I've never had an inheritance like that. That's pretty awesome inheritance. But here's the thing. It's his inheritance in the saints. Think about this. The inheritance of Jesus, the joy that was set before him that caused him to endure the cross was you and me and everybody that comes to Christ. Think about this. He tied him getting his inheritance eternally and irrevocably to you and me stepping into our calling. In other words, he didn't stay on planet earth to get his inheritance. He went to heaven, and when he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men, and he sent his presence, his power, and his glory, and he anointed his church to go out and get the harvest, which is people. People are what's valuable on the earth. That's what's valuable. It's not wealth. It's not, it's not buildings. It's not land. It's not people are what's... That's what we're going to take out of this whole deal. As many people as possible, we want to bring to eternal glory. Amen? Amen. That is the goal. It's people. And Jesus paid, made, did everything he could do to, to open up the gates of heaven so everyone could come in. But then he said to his church, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so his harvest, he's entrusted you and me to get that harvest. Isn't that amazing he would give us that kind of responsibility? It's, it is, that, that's how much God thinks of you. That's how much God trusts you. That's a lot of trust, isn't it? <laughs> wow. The hope of his calling and his inheritance in the saints. Turn over to Romans 4. I want to spend some time over here talking about Abraham. Because Abraham is such a great example of somebody who had some tremendous cha challenges and impossibilities in front of him and how he overcame. And I really want us to spend some, some time on this tonight because I think it will really help us. Are you there? In Romans chapter 4. I'm going to talk about audacious hope. Audacious hope, and I'll define that in a moment. But Romans 4.17 says this. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall your seed be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Now, this is awesome because it talks about how Abraham went from being a person with a promise with a, to a person with an inheritance. And I always like to look at the mechanics of somebody's life and see what they did to walk out what God said about their life. Because God said, has God said some things about your life? I bet he said some good things that were going to happen in your life. Anybody got some promises that are unfulfilled as of yet? That it, but you're, you're ripe for the promise. You're like, you're trusting the Lord, and he said some great things about you. Amen. So to, to start this out, Abraham had audacious hope. Audacious means this, extremely bold or daring, recklessly brave or fearless. And uh, I believe, you know, Abraham is 
the father of faith because he showed us, he pioneered walking in faith and believing God against everything else. So Abraham was faced with all these obstacles that we just read about. He believed against natural hope. In other words, if he was to assess his situation logically and with reason, he would have said, there's no way what God has said to me could ever come to pass. <laughs> I believe Abraham was 75 years old when the, when the Lord first made him this promise that we're going to talk about. And he was already really old in natural terms of fulfilling this promise. Um, but the first obstacle Abraham had is he had to not consider his body. Abraham's 100 years or 99 years old, almost 100 years old, so his body is basically dead or incapable of fathering a child at this point because he's so old, right? So he has, number one, he has to totally discount his own abilities. And let me tell you something. God will call you to do something specifically that you don't have the ability to do. He will call you to do something that you feel uncomfortable to do because then you will have to tap in to his grace to do it and not trust in yourself, right? Now, in some cases, this works, this works where you have gifts that God's put in you from a childhood and you have a, a natural, it's not a natural, it's still supernatural, God put it there, gifting to make things easy. But sometimes God will call you to do things that you feel the least qualified to do and the least comfortable doing in the natural, and he calls you to do that because then you'll, you'll be like Moses and you're like, oh, I can't do this, Lord. Without your, without your help, without your grace, I will totally fail at this. You will have to trust your Father. And that's when you tap into grace, is when you realize you need grace. When you don't real, think you need grace, you're, li you're not as likely to tap into it, are you? But when you know you really need it, <laughs> you will humble yourself and you will cry out for the grace of God. So he had to discount his natural ability. You're gonna have to not put your confidence in your natural ability, but in God's supernatural ability in your life. Number two, he didn't consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. So he had some deadness and his wife had deadness. Now, Sarah's womb was dead twice because even in her prime, she never had any children, did she? So she, she, was, a, she was barren number one, and now she's way too old, even if she would have been somebody that would have had kids. Now she's 90 years old. She's way past the time where she can have kids. So Abraham had to not consider his own ability. Uh, he had to discount his own circumstances, and then he had to discount the circumstances of those surrounding, them, surrounding him or the weaknesses of those around him. If you're going to do something great for God, you can't do it alone. You're going to have to have people there to help you. And you're not going to, have, you're not going to be able to look at the weaknesses of people. You're going to have to keep your eyes on the Lord and realize that God has called people around you and his anointing on their life will make the difference in their life just like his anointing on your life will make the difference in your life. Right? We can't look at people. We can't look at our own ability. We look at the Father. And we look at what he said and his ability. We've got to discount all these other things. He did, number three, he didn't waver through unbelief. He didn't waver through unbelief. To waver means to move unsteadily back and forth, back and forth. It means to exhibit indecision. Ah, maybe God will. Maybe, maybe he won't. I don't know if I heard God right. Uh, maybe they missed God in that prophetic word. I don't, all this indecision, that's wavering. That's wavering, isn't it? It's back and forth. What does James chapter uh, 1 say? An unstable man will not receive anything of the Lord because he's driven and tossed like a wave. Back and forth, back and forth, unstable. No, Abraham wasn't like that. He was not like that. Instead, he trusted in the Lord, didn't he? He didn't waver uh, with unbelief. Why? Because he was fully convinced that God was able what does that mean, church? He was fully convinced in the ability of God. Now, this seems like Christianity 101, but we need to hear this. God is able. God is able. Whatever you're facing, God is able. Matter of fact, he's not only able, 
But Ephesians 3.20 puts it this way in the Amplified. It says, now to him who by, in consequence of, the action of his power that, that is at work within us is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly far over and above all that we dare ask or think, listen to this, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. Did you hear that, church? He can do super abundantly and infinitely beyond the highest prayer you can pray. The, the most amount of faith, even if you just sat there for a year and, and just exercised your imagination to the full capacity a human being can do it, God would be like, oh, is that all? Because I can do way more than that. I can do it before the sun goes down. That's all you got? Can you not think of more? I mean, think about this. The universe that they know of is 13.7 billion light years in every direction, right? That's big. <laughs> it's, it's really, really, really unimaginably large how big the universe is. And our daddy created that in six days. Not just that, but everything in it. Think of that. Think of that. And he never took his word back. He said, let, let there be light. So it keeps growing and expanding and getting bigger, <laughs> which means it had a beginning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Think of that. Our God is a big God. We have no, there's just no earthly idea for us to really get a, an understanding of how big the universe is. And he created it. He created you and me. He created everything. And just that took him six days. He, he is an awesome God. He is just awesome. So I want to tell you, no matter what you're facing, the problem is not God's ability. You can just throw that out. I don't know if God's able. He is really able. He really is able. You, you know, if the whole planet believes God to our maximum capacity, the lights won't blink in heaven. There won't be like a little flicker. <laughs> the Father won't call a committee meeting of the Trinity and they'll go, they're believing us for this. What are we going to do? It, that's not going to happen. <laughs> the father's going to go, oh, is that all? Okay, boom, done deal. <laughs> Amen. Our God is awesome. Isn't it awesome that we don't have to serve some of these false gods that people serve that can only do like one little thing and it's just a demonic operation and somebody comes on the name of Jesus and just crushes it? <laughs> we get to serve the most high God who is omnipotent and all-powerful. He's awesome. But not only is he all-powerful, he is tender. His tender mercies and loving kindness are over all his works. Because if he was just powerful, he, he would just scare the fire out of us, right? We'd just be like, ah, because he's so powerful. But he's omnipotent, and yet he's tender, merciful, loving. What an amazing combination. God is so wonderful. I just like talking about him. <laughs> I like, don't you like just bragging on him? Well, he did this for me and he did that and he said this and, ah, oh, he's good. Hallelujah. You know, book of Malachi says he listens to what we say and he likes to hang around those that start bragging on him. Amen. <laughs> well, I want to find out how Abraham overcame every reason that tried to stop him. How about you? Okay, well, let's look in this. Look at this and figure some things out by faith. <laughs> Number one, he was strengthened in faith. How? Giving glory to God. Giving glory to God. Now, what does this look like? It looks like 1 Peter 1.8. Talking about Jesus says, and it says this, whom having not seen you love. We're talking about Jesus here. We haven't seen him with our physical eyes some of you may, I have not, whom having not seen you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So it says right here that Abraham received the promise, 
right here it says in 1 Peter that we haven't seen the Lord with our eyes, yet we believe what his word says and what he's promised. And because we believe, we rejoice. And when we rejoice, we receive the end of our faith. In other words, our rejoicing and our praise releases some things. And a lot of Christians just don't get this. But it, nevertheless, it's really, really true. Your praise releases things because it's an expression of faith. Praise is saying, Lord, I believe you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I believe you above any circumstance I face. I believe what your word says. And the Bible says, Abraham was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Now, I want to ask myself, why was he giving glory to God? And for what was he giving God glory? I think those are two important questions, don't you? It's good to, was he just giving glory to God because he's in covenant with God or what, what's going on here? No, there was something specific Abraham was dealing with. See, faith can get real specific over an issue in your life. And see, right here, Abraham was getting real specific with his believing God. And so he was rejoicing over a specific situation. And so we need to look at that. What was it? Abraham was rejoicing over the promises of God, the specific prophecies over his life. In other words, God, not just that he was in the kingdom of God or that, that he had eternal life and, and, and that he was you know, in covenant with God and he was a friend of God. Those are all awesome things. But Abraham in this context very specifically was rejoicing over a very specific situation. Because when Abraham was 75 years old, God made him a promise that you're going to be the father of many nations. He's, he made a promise to him about your seed. The sand on the seashore, your seed's going to outnumber. And the stars in the heaven, your seed's going to outnumber. It's, it, it, it's going to be like that is what he said. It's going to be like that. I shouldn't say outnumber. But it's going to be like that. Now, a multitude of seed, right, from Abraham's life. He's 75 years old, and then he tries to help God with Hagar and has an Ishmael. And I'm sure none of us have ever done anything in our life while we were uh, waiting for the promise of God to try and help the Lord out because after all, he needs our help. <laughs> he doesn't need our help, does he? <laughs> no, faith and patience work together. Patience is very important, isn't it? Amen? So Abraham is believing God over a specific situation. Now when Abraham's 99 and Sarah's 90, God comes along and he changes his name. He changes his name from Abram, which means exalted father. Abram, every, every day, Abraham, or Abram at this time, he has 318 trained servants. So, ladies, if Abram had 318 under an inferior covenant, and we have a better covenant established upon better promises. <laughs> I'm just letting you get your faith out there. If you're wanting a cook and a house cleaner and da 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 Anyway. <laughs> hey, why not believe God, right? Amen? You can devote yourself to kingdom business. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah! Amen. So he had 318 people working for him. Praise God, we can have 319 plus. But every day, Abraham heard 318 people saying, exalted father, where do you want me to put the donkeys? Exalted father, where do you want me to stack the new gold that came in today? Exalted father, we don't have enough room for the silver. We need to, <laughs> right? We know that because in the Bible in Genesis 12, it says Abraham, Abram was exceedingly rich in cattle, silver, and gold. For some reason, God wanted us to know that he had material wealth and blessing. Right? God, because God wants to bless us. Amen. The first step from you get, if you're not there yet, the first step to you heading down that path is knowing it's the will of God. Knowing that the Lord wants to bless you. Regardless of what you've experienced, you know, experience is not your teacher. The word is your teacher. And if you just let experience teach you, it doesn't work out real good. It gives the, the, the test first and the answer second, right? Is that right? 
<laughs> yeah, amen. I've heard Apostle Ricky say that, and that, that's not how you want to learn. I would rather get the wisdom of God so that when I face the test, then I know the answer before I take the test, right? Amen. amen. Well, let's get back into this. Let's see here. So Abram, he's hearing all the time, exalted father, exalted father, exalted father. All of a sudden, God appears to him and changes his name. Now, this goes with, with Romans 4, where it says, God calls those things which be not as though they were. Now, if you're walking in natural wisdom and understanding, this can seem rather uncomfortable, <laughs> and rather rather strange, but it's not strange in the kingdom. This is normal Christianity. God changes Abram, Abram's name from exalted father to Abraham, puts himself in the Hebrew. He puts a Hebrew letter that stands for God in the middle of his name and changes his name to father of many nations. So now, Abraham wakes up in the morning and he's hearing all 318 of his trained servants saying, hey, father of many nations. Had he had any kids yet? Was Sarah pregnant yet? No. But every day, probably hundreds of times, he's hearing, hey, father of many nations. Hey, father of many nations. Every time he heard say, somebody say, hey, father of many nations, he was literally meditating on the prophetic utterance that God had released over his life. That would be like 318 people coming to you daily and rehearsing the prophetic words that God has spoken over your life. What is that called? That's called meditating on the word, right? And we're going to get to that. Turn over to 1 Timothy 1.18. Because what do you do with a prophecy over your life? You just say, is that, that's nice? Praise God for a prophetic word. No. <laughs> We're going to look at how to activate prophecies in your life. 1 Timothy 1.18. This charge I commit to you, child Timotheus, according to the prophecies that went before upon you, that you may war in them the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which certain having thrust away concerning the faith did make shipwreck. Okay, so there's some words we're going to look, look at this about prophecies. Because let me just say this about prophecies. A prophecy is anything the Lord could have told you that's going to happen in the future. I mean, in 2003, the Lord said, I want you to start a church. I want you to call it Oasis Church. It shall be an oasis in a dry place. And he instructed me. So that was 2003, but it wasn't until 2006 that it came to pass. So that was a prophetic word about the future, right? So anyway... God can speak a prophetic word into your life just to you personally. He could quicken the scripture, and that scripture could become a, a rhema word where you understand that's the Lord speaking this real specific to me right now, and I need to hear this. He could send a prophet or a person to speak a prophetic utterance to you that would release a prophetic word to you, and that's one of the most powerful parts of the prophet's ministry is doing that, and prophets do that. Not, you know, Some prophets do that over individuals, but it's a higher level when they do it over nations and regions and change whole nations and regions, right? So uh, Paul's telling Timothy how to deal with a prophecy so that he can see because there's a lot to look at here. First of all, he says this, the prophecies went before. The prophecies went before. Now, there's a specific Greek word that talks about went before. Here's what it says in the Greek. If you look at these definitions, it means to lead forward. Prophetic, a, a prophetic word can lean you, lead you forward. But think about this. Now, some of you may have buzzers going off. Oh, we're not led by prophecies. I understand we're not led by them. We're led by Holy Spirit. But if we discern a prophetic utterance, is from the Lord and it bears witness with our heart, then there can be an element of guidance to it. Usually it's confirming what's already in our heart, the vast majority. Sometimes there'll be some additional revelation to it that we, and you know, I don't, I don't go on other people's prophetic revelation to me, what they see. I go by what the Lord says to me and I find that the, the vast majority of prophetic utterances confirm what I've already heard God say. Okay, but sometimes there's been a couple times where I've been around some really accurate prophets that have spoken some things that I hadn't seen yet that have already come to pass in my life. 
So I, I put it on the shelf, but I don't throw it out. I don't think you should throw it out. Listen, it's kind of prideful to think that God has put a special office in his church called the prophet, and their whole supernatural ability of God is to operate in visions, the seer realm. There's the Nabi prophet. The Nabi prophet is the prophet that has like a, a unction come up uh, out of here and they prophesy that way. Then there's the panoramic seer prophet and they see things in the spirit. They see in the spirit and they're called seers, right? There's different types of prophets, but God has specifically and especially equipped prophets with an ability and a sensitivity to hear and know his voice to help you. Okay. He's given you Holy Spirit to see whether it bears witness or not. Okay? So I'm just trying to bring a little bit of balance here because there's, there's kind of two sides of the coin where we can get in a ditch on. Okay, Let's go back to this. So it says prophecies went before. So Paul spoke prophetic utterances to Timothy. And these prophetic utterances, they went before. One of the definitions is to lead you forward. Another definition is to bring you out. <laughs> Have you ever been stuck in a place, it seems like, and you've been trying to come out, you've been trying to change the season or what's been going on in your life or how do we get this to change? And all of a sudden, a, pro a prophet comes along or somebody speaks a prophetic word and it's like all of a sudden, it's like a rocket booster pushes you forward out of the situation you've been in and all of a sudden everything starts changing. Has anybody ever experienced that? Because I've experienced that and it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> it's part of the ministry of the prophet. It's part of the ministry of the prophet. Um, praise God. To bring out, it means to the prophecies that went before. It means to lead the way. It means to pre proceed or go, go in front of and it means to guide. Okay, so prophetic words go before you. I believe when God speaks a prophetic word over your life, it goes ahead of you and it starts changing situations and it starts changing and opening a way and creating a door and creating a set of circumstances for the, it to come to pass. Amen? I believe that. Then it says the prophecies went before, but then there's another Greek word that says the prophecies are on you. They're on you. That means they're, up, and if you look at that Greek word, it means the prophecies are upon you. It means they're under you. <laughs> they also means those prophecies are against. Guess who they're against? All your foes that try and stop them from coming to pass. Right? The devil and his dark kingdom. Those prophecies are going to stop the, the, the dark kingdom from stopping you. Because those prophetic words literally move enemies out of the way. Glory to God. Amen. The prophecies are toward something. They're toward your destiny. And it also means they're over you. And it also means they're among you. Meaning the prophetic words that you have, I believe, aren't just for you, but they're for everybody around you. They're, they're going to affect you. Before, a long time ago, Canada and I would get prophetic words. And before we were pastors, and we'd think about ourselves and go, Oh my gosh, how on earth is this ever going to happen? Now when we get prophetic words, we go, praise God. We know these great prophetic words we're getting, they're not about us. It's for the whole church and what God's going to do in us collectively. Almost um, most of the time, every now and then we get something that's real specific for us. And, you know, but a lot of times we're like, praise God, this is, that's why I release prophetic words. That's why I read them. That's why uh, I write those down. And I have an archive on my computer of all the video or audio of prophecies that have been spoken over me, or I've got them typed out or both. So I can go back and just listen to them. And, there, and there's, let's keep going. We're going to find out why. Oh my goodness. Praise God. War in them, the good warfare. So Paul tells Timothy, there's a war with these prophecies. What is the war? You speak the prophecies. You meditate on the prophetic words given to you. You present them in prayer before the Father. Okay? Now, think about this. Joshua has taken over the nation of Israel as the primary leader. Moses has been the leader. What did God tell Joshua? He said, this book of the law shall not depart from out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then you will make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success. Now I went to read that and the Holy Ghost just made this jump off the page. This book. Why'd God tell Joshua this book? 
Because if you go back and read Joshua 1, the whole first chapter of the book of Joshua is God releasing prophetic words to Joshua that no man can stand before him. Be strong and a good courage. I'm going to go with you like I was with Moses. I'll be with you. All this prophetic encouragement is in Joshua 1. It's great. You know, Joshua could read about the good things Moses did in Numbers and Deuteronomy and all this Exodus. And that's great. Wonderful. But you know what, Joshua, you meditate on this book, the book of Joshua. Why? Because in this book, I've spoken specific things to you that will give you the grace, the empowerment, the courage to walk out the plan of God for your life. And when God speaks a prophetic word to you, church, when he says something to you, whether it comes from someone else or it comes up out of your heart, comes in your prayer time, however he releases it, it's for you to cherish, to latch hold of, to believe, to speak, to meditate. You speak it, you meditate on it, and you also bring it before the Lord in prayer. Isaiah 43, 25 says this, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Verse 46, put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. One translation says justified. Now, so you you get a prophetic word and you meditate on the prophetic word, right? God told Joshua. He didn't just say meditate on all my law, although Absolutely, Joshua was to meditate on all the law. But he said, you need to have this book before you all the time. You need to live here. Why? Because you're going to face situation after situation where you're going to need to know what I told you. And all of us are going to face situation after situation where we're going to have to hear what God said about our life and believe it. Because here's something. Three things happen when you do this, church. There may be more, but I know of three. (laughs) Three really good things happen when we take the prophetic utterances God has spoken about us. Something happens when we're praying them and we're bringing them before the Father. Father, you said that I would do this. You said you'd call me to do this. Father, this is what your prof- this is what you said to me. This is what the prophet said to me. Lord, I believe this and I present it back to you as your will and I present it at your throne, Father. I thank you, Lord, for what you've said and I believe it's coming to pass. Amen. You're presenting it before the Lord. You're not presenting your will. You're presenting what he said to you. Lord, this is your will. This is your plan. I'm agreeing with you. See, God's voted for you and the devil's voted against you. You need to cast the deciding vote on every situation. Vote with God. Amen? Okay. So when you start doing this, what? You get the prophetic things, the things God has spoken about your life, and you meditate on them. You pray them and put them before the Lord, and you're decreeing them, speaking them out of your mouth. What happens? Number one, your faith is strengthened. I mean, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Faith comes by hearing, comes by meditating. So you're speaking the promise of God. And number one, your faith is strengthened. Abraham was giving glory to God. What was his his glory to God looking like, I believe? Hallelujah, Father, glory to God. You've made me the father of many nations. My seed is like the stars of the heaven and the sand on the seashore. Glory to God. Did he have anybody in the natural? Nope. He didn't have his Isaac yet. But guess what? Guess how long it was? Abraham had been waiting from 25 to 99 to have his Isaac. Right? 24 years and nothing's happened. But as soon as the father changes his name to Abraham, father of many nations, and he's hearing every day, which is meditation, he's hearing over and over and over, you're the father of many nations, you're the father of many nations, you're the father of many nations. He's hearing it over and over and over. Within one year of his name change, he has Isaac, which means within three months, they had conceived Isaac. So it doesn't take God a whole long time when we get meditating on the word and meditating on the prophetic utterances. I think sometimes prophetic utterances are kind of hanging out there and we haven't been taught how to deal with them. Number one, you, you do these three things I'm talking about, you're going to have faith released in what God said. Number two, these prophetic utterances will bring transformation. Because here's one of the things a long time ago I noticed about accurate prophetic words. They transform you. 
It's not just about what God's calling you to do. They literally bring transformation. What do you mean? Have you noticed when God speaks to you, he never speaks to you about just the way you are now, but he speaks to your ultimate potential in Christ. He talks to you like you've ascended and you have achieved and you're walking in all he's called you to do and be. Have you noticed that? Because I've really noticed that. Amen? <laughs> it's, not, it's not that the people speaking are missing God. It's that God sees you at your fullness, your full potential, your full destiny, your full fruitfulness. And he speaks the end from the beginning. And he speaks to you <laughs> like you've already done all these things. And you're already at this state. And when he speaks to you, it's like it creates a suction in the spirit and it pulls you towards your potential or it propels you towards literally becoming that and being that. Because <laughs> whatever God calls something, it is. If he said today's Tuesday, it'd be Tuesday. Immediately, <laughs> wouldn't it? Number two, his prophetic words transform you. Especially when you begin to meditate and speak and pray them out in prayer. Number three, and we'll end here tonight. They divinely empower you. Prophetic utterances divinely empower you. Why? Prophetic utterances that Paul told Timothy to war over for his faith release the grace of God. To the degree that you believe what God is saying about you in a prophetic utterance, and it is a real prophetic utterance from heaven. I'm not talking about a false prophecy. I'm talking about it's really from God. You are literally tapping into the grace of God. God is saying, I'm releasing this into your life right now. And that means there is potential for it. And certain things will happen because God spoke. I believe that. But here's the thing. We have a part to play where we believe we mix faith in the word that's spoken. And when we do that, we're tapping into the grace that will literally empower us to walk out what he said we would do and be in his kingdom. So prophetic utterances, to recap, what, what do they do for us? Number one, they strengthen our faith. Number two, they bring transformation. And number three, they bring divine empowerment. They divinely empower you. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight that your church is filled with hope and peace and grace and faith. And Lord, that any prophetic promise that you've made to us, any, any word you've given to each one of us over our life and destiny, Lord, Father, I just thank you for resurrecting those things. That, it, Lord, that, yeah. <laughs> I just immediately, I saw a bookshelf, and I saw things like dust covered on the shelf. They're scrolls. I see scrolls, like, a, the, like the scrolls that have like a, um, a seal on them, like, you know, a king's signet ring stamp on them, and they'd be covered in, uh, on a shelf with dust. I just believe right now that the Lord is taking some of those things off the shelf that he said to you and he's resurrecting them and making them a fresh word. And maybe you lost hope, maybe you lost faith that is this ever gonna happen, Lord? Yes, church, it's gonna happen. God cannot lie. And let me tell you something, a promise is a promise.